Morning, everyone. Morning. Welcome to Church at Home. Very glad that you've tuned in with us today. Yes, it's a good day to be in church. And Always. we know that church is so much more than a building or than this screen. It's people and it's all of us. It's so you. we're super thankful for all of you and the community we are building here. Yeah. Yeah. Plenty of ways to get involved around this place. Uh, lots of different ways you can meet people. Uh, we've got life groups, they meet in people's homes, they talk about the Bible, often they have some good food. We do hot chocolates at our one, uh, that's good fun. It's a great way to meet people, great way to get properly connected in. Yeah, uh, we've also, so with Active, we've got running, riding, netball, basketball, all sorts of different um, movement activities for people of all abilities. So, love to see you around that place. Uh, there's also a play group for young families and even youth group, uh, which meets on every Friday night. Youth are having a ball at the moment. So, yeah. No yeah. room for being bored around here. Yeah, if you're school aged, get along to youth. <laughs> and our Young Adults crew just got back from their retreat. Yeah. Jacob and I head up our Young Adults 18 to 30-ish. Yep. And last weekend, we had the best time away. We spent two nights on Phillip Island. 50 of us and we just worshiped, prayed, off grid, had fun. It was really, really nice. Mm. What was your favorite part? Just relax. I, th I think there was one moment where uh, we just finished. We had some guest worship come from Stairway, Phoebe and Tom. Uh, it was just beautiful. And then after that, it was about 8.30 at night and uh, went downstairs and there's a whole gym that we had access to. Some people were shooting hoops and stuff. Someone set up a volleyball. Uh, so court. awesome. So a couple of us just started like playing volleyball, about four of us. And then a couple of people joined in, a couple of people joined in. And then after about half an hour, we had two teams of nine and about seven people. It was about half the retreat were watching this uh, volleyball comp. It was great. It was just so active sp volleyball spur of the moment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah so no, but other than the fun, there were, there were lots of moments where we could just you know walk and get a coffee. Mm. Um, surf. Surf, went for a surf. Lots of like restful moments where we could just like take a breath and, and ask God, like, who, who am I? Who are you asking? The question of the weekend was like, who, God, who, you, who do you want me to become? Mm. So there's lots of just thoughtful moments to just relax and, and hear from him. And mm. What about you? What was, what was your highlight? Um, I just loved drinking coffee with some people. G'day Tiger. Yeah, have just love chilling out and having good chats. Yeah. Mm, my favorite. And they did tea at the, uh, we, church, we visited a church, Phillip Island Baptist Church. So welcoming, so kind. Um, and after their services, they do tea. Mm -hmm. so a cup of tea on a Sunday and morning. And a biscoff. Yeah, it was, not, it was great. Yeah, so make sure you check out the church app so you can stay across all the different ways to connect in around here. Plenty of events and fun things going on. Um, and we'd love to just connect you in mm. and get to meet you. Um, yeah. And while you're there, why not how, head to the, the prayer wall. It's reasonably new on the app. So check out, there's a bunch of different prayers that people have put up uh, from this house. With, just people asking for prayer. And you, it's real easy, you just click click in, read a little bit about what they're, they've asked um, prayer for and you just click commit to pray and uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's encouraging for the people who need prayer for something because I can see that you know that this the family is getting around them and, and, and praying. So I thought uh, I've actually prepared earlier. Here's what it looks like, the prayer wall. Um, That's so, so cool. There's a, a bunch of things on there at the moment. Um, one of them is August 5th, there's the winter night shelter. It says, prayer for the people who are coming to the winter shelter, that they'll see and meet Jesus, that they will feel his love and peace, and they feel safe, and they'll feel comfortable to come to the winter shelter. So let's commit to pray to that. <laughs> let's pray now. Uh, God, thank you so much for the opportunity to care for people who don't have a home at the moment. We ask that as they come, uh, they feel warmth, they feel mm -hmm loved, yeah. uh, they feel known, and they feel yeah. seen um, by by this community and, and seen by you, Jesus. We, we ask that uh, in, in the process of getting to know a bunch of people who just want to get around them and, and support them and, and give them a warm night to sleep, uh, we just ask that they can also come to know you um, and that you can embrace them. Um, and yeah, just ask that you can show the people who are running that night uh, how to best support them and, and uh, yeah, lead the way. We trust you and we, we love you. Amen. Amen. Nice. That's so cool. And um, massive thank you to everyone who gives faithfully to this place yep. and its mission. It's because of you that we are able to be light and create spaces of community for people and also ho host the homeless through mm. the winter. Um, it's such a worthy work and we just want to commend you for your support. So if you'd like to start your giving journey today or maybe it's been a while since you've given, just head to the app or use the details provided. Yeah, appreciate that. Well, today we get to hear from Marcy. She's going to wrap up our series on Ruth, which I've really loved. Such a good series. It's great. Mm. Yeah, so much in it. So, so many great stories in within a story. Um, but before that, Olympic style, 
On your marks, get set, worship. Remember those walls that we call sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape, but he came. Remember those giants we call dead and gray. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now.
Morning Gateway. Um, today we're going to finish our series on Ruth. Uh, I, I think it's been really beautiful. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as, uh, as I have. But I think um, probably most of you who are listening now would consider yourselves Christians, people who have dedicated their lives to following Christ, to copying his ways, his works and his words. And I assume that hopefully that you have people in your life who are not Christians. How do you think they perceive you? What do you think they say about you when they, when they talk about you behind your back? Do they think you're weird? Do they think you're different? Maybe sort of different in a good way. Maybe exceptional people. Wouldn't it be nice if they thought that? You, you would hope that the longer you walk with Christ, the more you follow him, the more you mould yourself to be like him, the more you develop something precious and rare. Noble character. Now in the story of Ruth and Boaz, the Bible says that both of them had this. We're told they had noble character. Can you think of someone in your life who you would describe as having noble character? What are some of their qualities? Maybe they're trustworthy, patient, loving, compassionate, loyal, kind. They have integrity. 
and I would I would bank that they're also generous. Why the word noble? Well, to have to have noble qual, um, character means that you have the qualities of royalty or nobility, to be like the king. And who is our king? Of course, it's Jesus. Our God-ordained destination in life is to have noble character, the character of our King Jesus. Now, I just want to park that thought for a moment. We're going to come back to it. The story of Ruth is such a special one because many of the great themes of Scripture are hidden in its storyline. You know, we often, we often talk about these threads that are running right through the scripture. Now, Rick talked last week about the thread of radical and surprising welcome by God of the outsider, of the marginalized. And we, th we see through story after story through the scripture, a God who invites all to be part of his great partnership with humanity. Our role as Christ followers is to pick up that thread and continue it in the way that we open our arms of welcome and mercy. That is noble character. That's the character of Christ. You know, there is another beautiful golden thread that runs right through scripture. And it is the thread of generosity. It's all through the Bible, but especially in Ruth. We see it in the character of Boaz and Ruth. When we are generous, we act with noble character. We reflect the values and the character traits of our king. Now, just for a few minutes, let me saturate you with this golden thread. Are you ready for a quick tour along that thread? We're going to go from Genesis to Revelation in a couple of minutes. So, let's start right at the beginning. Genesis 2. God gives us creation. Then the Lord formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils and the man became a living person. God gives us life. We are designed to care for this world and each other. Then further into Genesis, we read about Abraham. Now, Abraham is the man on whom God chose to build his family, the man whose family would be a blessing to every nation of the world. But did you ever wonder why God chose Abraham? Now, I think there's a bit of a, a hint to it in Genesis 13. Abraham was told to leave the land that he lived in by God and move to another place. And when he went, you can imagine he's um, uh, there uh, going through the desert, they're nomad people, and he's taking all of his flocks and his, his uh, family with him. And he also took his nephew, Lot, and Lot also had a lot of flock of uh, flocks of um, sheep and goats. And what happened is that they they started to run out of pasture land and water for their animals. So he said to Lot, "Look, how about we separate? We we both find a place where we can settle down, and uh, and that way there'll be plenty of uh, resources for our animals." Now. That sort of a situation would often cause a war in ancient times. But this is what happened with Abraham Lot. Abraham said to his nephew, the whole countryside is open to you. Take your choice of any section of the land you want and we will separate. Lot took a long look at the fertile plains of the Jordan Valley. The whole area was well watered everywhere, like the Garden of the Lord or the beautiful land of Egypt. Lot chose for himself the whole Jordan Valley to the east and he went there with his flocks and servants and parted company with his uncle Abram. Now who does that? Who just says to his nephew, you choose what you like and of course the nephew chose the best land. Abraham's generosity is extraordinary. He had noble character and I have no doubt 
That is the reason that God chose him. We move into Leviticus, where God is setting out the plan for how his people will bless others. They will give. He says to them, when you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your field and do not pick up what the harvesters drop. Leave it for the poor and the foreigners living among you. I am the Lord your God. Isn't it interesting that that command is finished with those words, I am the Lord your God. It's like, if I am your God, then I'm expecting you to behave in a certain way. I'm, be, I'm expecting you to have noble character. And that is that you give. You don't keep all of your resources for yourself. In the book of Psalms, the people sing these lyrics because the Psalms are basically song lyrics to remind themselves that they must be generous to reflect God's noble character. Light shines in the darkness for the godly. They are generous, compassionate and righteous. And Proverbs, that book of wisdom, these are, these are wise sayings that, that are being repeated down from one generation to another. Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Then we come into the prophets towards the end of uh, the Old Testament. And the prophets were people who heard the voice of God and they're shouting out to their people, this is who God is. This is how we reflect his character. Feed the hungry and help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness and the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. God's promises to those who are generous to others. Malachi was the last prophet. He is the last book in the Old Testament section of the Bible before a silence of 400 years where we didn't hear anything from God. And he's saying to his people, be noble, give back to God what is his. You have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there will be enough food in my temple. And this is important because this is where the poor went when they were starving. They went to the temple and there had to always be extra food there so that they could be helped. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the, the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Then we come to the New Testament. God gives himself to us in the person of Jesus. He shows us in skin and bone what noble character looks like. And in the gospel stories, Jesus teaches in story after story after story that we must be people who give, who are generous. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. Paul, Paul, the great apostle who is trying to teach this new church community, how to reflect Christ. He has so much to say about being generous. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. When we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. And his instructions to the young pastor Timothy, he says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they are storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so they may experience 
true life. That's a description of noble character. And of course, the Bible finishes with revelation and this vision of the end of all things where God gives us a whole new world, a whole new creation. Could the thread of generosity be any clearer? I think that Ruth, the book of Ruth, carries in it a gem of a picture that can help us to know how to be generous. And this gem comes out of the book of Leviticus. Don't harvest to the edge of your field. Now, Boaz lived in the time of the judges and it says in the scripture that this was a time with no leadership in, in um, Israel. It said that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Well, Boaz was a man of noble character. So for him to do what was right in his own eyes was to follow the laws that God set for his people in Leviticus. He did not harvest his field to the edges. He left a margin around the edge for the sake of others. And that's how Ruth's life was saved from crushing poverty through the generosity of Boaz. Now, of course, we're not harvesting fields today, but there is a clear connection for us today. And the meaning is that, that God has given all of us resource. We have money, we have possessions, we have talents, we have time, we have abilities. And God is saying, use them, but they are not all for you. He gives us resources so we can be like him. We can bless others. We can share what we have. We can be givers. We can show the noble character of God. Well, I think I might need a whiteboard to illustrate this. Magic! All right, things that we can do. Thanks, Zach. All right, so just imagine this is our field. It really represents all that we have in life. And maybe if I was going to harvest my field and leave 10%, it sort of might look a bit like that. Now, God says that we've got 90% to use and enjoy. So, I wonder what's the sort of things that might go in your 90%. I would have thought there's our mortgage, especially at the moment, that has to be paid for. We've got our bills. Obviously, there's food, clothes, those necessary things we need. Maybe... We'd like to be able to have some money for recreation, maybe a, maybe a holiday, and it'd be great if we could also save a few dollars as well, wouldn't it? Put something away for a rainy day. But in this 10% space, there must be room for us to be generous, to use our resources for the sake of others. And this, this area really represents the compassionate concerns of God. Now, when I think about some of them, what are, what are some of God's compassionate concerns? We would have to put things down like poverty. Maybe, in, especially in Melbourne at the moment, we would we'd have to list down homelessness. I think we'd also put in things like loneliness. Maybe, especially for many young people today, there's a lot of mental health issues that I know must really break the heart of God. 
Don't forget people who don't know God. People who don't know that they have been created for a purpose and that God loves them. I think, I mean, there are many more that we could list, but these are some of the big concerns that we know are on God's heart because they're on our heart. Can we do anything about these big issues? Well, on our own, no. It would be very difficult. But that's the beauty of the church. When we band together, when we all take our margins, our 10% margins, and we put them together, then we can really make a difference. Those of you who give to this family, those of you who, who leave a margin and give to the work of Gateway, you allow Sally Ansell to work at organising the Winter Night Shelter, which is a noble solution to homelessness for some people in, on the peninsula. You know, she was called in at 2am the other night to relieve a volunteer who was ill. Your giving facilitates that. Those of you who give to this family are sponsoring Rick and Trish to be in PNG, providing leadership to a thriving school in the middle of an urban slum. 250 kids and therefore many hundreds more people are being given the chance to rise out of the cycle of poverty through education. Those of you who give to this family sponsor Ricky to put together a fundraising bike ride that will raise over $200,000 for the PNG cause next year. And as he does that, people who don't know Jesus are being drawn into the circle of his love through sport and fitness and community. Those of you who give to this family sponsor Singe to run a teenage mental health program that we call Gateway Youth. These kids are finding purpose through finding Jesus. They are pushing back loneliness and isolation. And this has been the case for hundreds and hundreds of kids. Those of you who give to this family sponsor Sally Jones to create an environment for our kids where they learn the story. God is real. God is for them. And you are literally helping to shape the next generation. Those of you who give to this family allow myself and Hannah and Trish and Zach to run a team of creative people who bring the joy and beauty of God to people through music and theatre and the arts. We've seen so many kids find purpose and connection and ultimately Jesus. This is the fruit of not harvesting to the edge of your field and it is both a reflection of noble character and a creator of it. Now, would we rather use all our resources for ourselves? Probably. But every time we fight the desire to pull all of our resource into our own barns, we show the world exactly why Christians are weird and exceptional. We don't harvest to the edge of our fields. We leave margin for the needs of others. What do we get out of it? Nothing and everything. We don't give to please God so he will bless us back financially. We give because God calls us to be like him. His agenda is compassion. We give because it is good for us. We grow, we stretch, we push back the great sin of selfishness in our hearts and we become people of noble character. Now, as we finish up today, I recognise that for, for most of us, we find this really hard. And we find it hard because of fear. Fear that there won't be enough. Fear of missing out on something. Fear of lack. And the way you combat fear is with faith. 
you believe that God is generous, that God will provide. That's how you get the strength to leave the edges of your field unharvested. And I don't know about you, but I need to be in the presence of this family every week. I need my church family to help me to have faith that God is good, He is for us, and that there is more than enough in the kingdom if we all share the resource that we have. So as we finish, let me just encourage all of us by reading the words from Jesus himself, who was addressing people even back then who felt exactly the same way we do. From Matthew chapter six, part of the Sermon on the Mount. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths can eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other, so you cannot serve both God and money. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for their heavenly father feeds them and aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. So seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. Live with noble character. And he will give you everything that you need. Before I took a breath, you were singing over me. And you have been so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me And you have been so, so kind to me And all the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God 
Great. Thanks so much for that message, Marcy. It's a, it's a great challenge. It's a, mm. a big challenge to ask ourselves just to be honest with ourselves mm. uh, about whether we're operating in fear mm. or whether that spirit of lack or not having enough is actually driving some of our decisions. Yeah. It's a big one. It's easy to slip into that, right? Mm. Um, but it was great to be reminded that we are children of God yeah. and that He cares for us and He has us covered and that we can trust in His love, His provision and His care. It's good. It's a great story. Mm. Good stuff. Well, we've had a wonderful week. I'll uh, see you all back here next week at 10 a.m. for Church at Home. Bye! When I look back, I can see your hand all over my past. Even in the times I'd rather forget. I just can't believe you'd love me like that, love me like that. Yeah. You never left me oh, You always
Yeah 